uh, and then it was just like all right do I work out do I want to um, get back in control and still be able to have a bet with my mates or do I just stop altogether and um, I made the decision to just stop altogether which is completely yeah. my decision um, the people who are around um, they they you pretty much got to accept what the person wants to do or it's not going to work so yeah uh then we don't work a long time ago now it's about six years wow <laughs> uh, yeah um and then yeah it's pretty much just my the family um you, i just started telling telling people what was going on because yep. um that's the, the way i kept myself accountable so, boom. How you going, guys? Um, excited. We got uh, Aaron and Alan. So, um, yeah, what's happening? We've introduced them before. As I explained, I uh, fuck up these introductions. So, that's already pre-recorded. So, we're all good to go. How you going, guys? <laughs> yeah, going well. Yeah. Um, going good. Nice. Now, for everybody listening, um, this is kind of the first experiment with multiple people on the Zoom on the Zoom call because obviously we got uh, the COVID lockdown situation, so it can make it a bit tricky to navigate sometimes. So forgive us if the audio is bad or we talk over each other at points. But um, yeah, look. So today we got um, you guys on the show because as I was explaining to you before, um, obviously podcast is called Real Drug Talk. Um, we talk a lot about addiction in general, but you know, mainly drugs and alcohol. But um, I guess in these extra challenging times, we've been, um, you know, uh, getting a lot of people reach out to us and ask about gambling. Um, and people are really, really struggling with it. Um, obviously, yeah, people have lost their jobs, they're stressed, different stuff's going on. And um, the first person that binged into my head um, was you, Alan. And I remember when we did a little um, podcast, I think it was last year. Um, yeah, when you were explaining your story, I thought that's exactly the same as like what mine was like with drugs and alcohol, but just a different kind of thing. So um, yeah, thanks for coming on. Do you want to just... Um, and I'm really excited as well to hear Aaron's perspective, like as the family member and how everything impacted um, you as a family member. So do you want to just like tell us quickly, Alan, and then Aaron, I guess the three minute snapshot of your story? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess growing up in a family that always punted, um, we so, or sort of always around it. So I, uh, I've said it in, in our podcast, like I, I can't blame my family for um, what it turned into, but um, yep. definitely from um, the roots that were entrenched in my life uh, early on, there was definitely, uh, yeah, that family influence. Uh, but as um, I was drafted um, to Geelong 2009 and uh, I guess the the whole downtime earning some pretty good money as a as a young guy yeah it, it definitely turned into every single uh opportunity i got I, I was betting um trying to turn it into something else and chasing that thrill so it was probably went really bad from uh, when i was age 18 to 23 so yep. five years really consumed my life everything that i did had to do with the punt people I hung out with and yep. uh, yeah, it was pre pretty full on, but um, yeah, uh, uh, interesting to, to hear Aaron's side of things as well, because definitely just didn't affect me. It affected everyone around me. Yeah. So what were you going through as, as a brother watching Al go through all this at that time, Aaron? Um, I suppose for me, it was a bit, it was a bit different. I didn't really understand what was going on too much. Yeah. Um, because it was, it almost just became the normality. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'd go over there to his house in Geelong, and we'd stay up watching the Hong Kong races uh, <laughs> at four o'clock in the morning. So, um, but when when everything did unfold, um, it probably yeah, there were some pretty underlying, obviously, issues there. And um, I, I think it's credit to mum and dad how how strong they were and the upbringing they. They provided us how strong as a family. Um, yeah, we're able to stick together. But yeah, obviously it was some pretty challenging, some pretty challenging months. Yeah. 
Um, so, so Alan, because that's interesting when you say Aaron, like about the uh, the Hong Kong races. Um, so I imagine it didn't start with sitting up in the morning betting on the Hong Kong races. Like, at what point did it kind of go from um, having fun, I guess, because I, I suppose for a lot of people, maybe that's where it starts, just having fun betting with some mates and correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if that's kind of a big part of it for you, but at what point did it go from, yeah, just socializing, having fun or doing it as an activity to like something that was a real problem betting on the races at one in the morning or whatever? Um, I, I guess the, the big thing at high school, my group of mates who are still my, my best friends, we would actually... Uh, every like homeroom before classes actually start, we'd actually sit and do the form, yeah, which is <laughs> pretty wow. crazy. As 16, 17 year olds, and we'd get year 12s to go put like two dollar bets on, which was at the time was it's just fun, like, yeah. but that's what we're doing. That became the norm in it in our uh, circle of friends. Then we uh, we just keep doing the same thing, but we we're getting older and we're earning more money. Yeah, I guess the the difference that came for me is that all my downtime I'd fill with um, betting. Even if we were um, playing PlayStation with my housemates, I'd be secretly like on my phone, like to the left of me, yeah. um, off the side of the couch, uh, having a bet between like breaks in FIFA or something like that. Wow. <laughs> so yeah. it was uh, yeah, it was pretty pretty full on. But I guess what I I got out of that is like the people I try and help now is you can make a, a choice that you can either go from uh, doing it not at all like, I, like I've done. So I've yeah. gone full, uh, full turkey or um, oh, cold turkey, sorry. And, or you can like get back in control of it and um, yeah. yeah, you can still have a bet with your mates on the weekend, which is a lot of um, what I found is what works really well for some people is, um, yep. You can actually still do that. But yeah, I, re I reckon it was when I sort of started earning the good money and having a lot of downtime because as an AFL footballer, you don't, uh, you don't work like full on hours, nine to five, always working. You have days off, you have uh, hours off at a time to like uh, recuperate your body. So yep. it, it probably came with finding that time and what am I going to fill my time with? Yeah. So can I ask kind of a curly question or maybe a tough question? Maybe you know the answer, maybe not, but, um, and it's kind of to both of you. So, so you mentioned that, um, yeah, not to blame, but it definitely was an environmental factor that you grew up around punting and all that kind of stuff. And it's interesting because so did I, my, um, parents are actually bookies and I think there's still a Nagel stand at the Caulfield racetrack here in Melbourne, but, um, and it definitely had an influence on me as well, but, um, you know, you ended up in this kind of spiral of gambling, Alan, but I'm tipping Aaron, maybe you didn't. And I'm not sure if you gambled at the time or like, do you guys have any insight into what the difference was and why one brother ended up kind of going down this path and the other didn't? Because that's a question people always ask me about both drugs and alcohol and gambling is why did I do it? Why didn't someone else yeah, get stuck in that trap? Uh, I guess for me, it was more um, I saw the negative connotations. Yeah. Uh, and I'd only just turned 18, 19, I think, at the time. So I saw what could happen. So that's why I've never really gone down that route again. Like I still yep. have mates and that have a good punt. Um, yep. and, I, and, you know, some of them you do, you do wonder, like, how much they are putting into it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for me, um, I just I've just seen the negative impacts it can have on the people around it. So I, I don't think I've I don't think I've had a punt maybe since Alan told us about the whole yeah um, how much he lost and everything like that. So yeah, and I, I'd be interested to know from your perspective, Alan, what do you think the factors are that um, kind of turn it from yeah, this thing that you're doing is a bit of fun with your mates into this full blown um, addiction. Like what, what's actually the stuff that adds to it? Is it something you've found that's kind of, you feel like it's genetic or is it environmental or is it like life pressures and stresses? Yeah. Like what, what actually pushes you over the edge? Do you reckon? Yeah, there's plenty uh, from what I've read and um, sort of what I've been through. I feel 
stress is a, a big one. Yeah. Uh, like trying to step outside your, yourself and put yourself somewhere else and trying to chase like a thrill is yeah. a, a, a massive thing. Uh, I feel like being an athlete and being a professional athlete, trying to uh, always be a winner, like not losing. Yeah. Um, has been a, a massive thing for me and people that I've dealt with is you go, Oh, well, I don't want, I don't want, I've lost 200. All right. I know I've got the money there. I'm yep. going to not lose. I want to turn this 200 into get back even. Then I'm going to keep putting money in. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel like that attitude towards um, losing um, as an athlete, but I feel like that could be with any professional, any yep. job, like I'm not going to lose, like I've got to win. So you just keep tipping more and more money and that's where you probably don't even realise and that's probably where I realised where I'm like, wow, every day I'd wake up and I was at zero. Yeah. So that was the that was the big thing for me. Like I might have lost two and a half grand the day before. Yeah. But I was I was even when I woke up the next morning. Yeah. Uh yeah, so they're probably the two main things that I, I I've worked out, but you know, your dependence on it. Mm. And I think that's with drugs and alcohol, you feel lost without it. And that's when you, yeah, that's when, you know, you probably tipped over that line where it's all you're thinking about. It's like um, infested your brain. So every ad you see, uh, you know, you see the form guide, you hear voices um, like commentators, all that sort of stuff. If that's in your head and you go, gee, like I can't wait to have a bet. And it's probably, you've probably gone over the line. Yeah, hundred percent. So, and the thing that I um, think is amazing about you guys just talking about it is, um, and that's inspiring for people and really, I guess, shatters the uh, commonly held stereotype of people um, that have addictions is that, you know, you kind of come from a certain socioeconomic class or um, you can't be successful in other areas of your life while this is all going on um and like what kind of effects did it have on you and your professional athletic career do you reckon it impacted it um and like what was the main impact aaron that it had on the family because i imagine it would have been quite a strange experience seeing alan on one hand excelling in these areas of one part of his life um, with footy, but then in the other, like everything's just kind of falling apart, I imagine, behind the scenes. Yeah, it was probably a credit to Alan. Like we weren't uh, aware of it during like those, those years at Geelong until probably yep. the end of his uh, tenure at Geelong. But I suppose for the family, it was just more the, um, like dad, dad, dad probably starts to punt every now and then. I don't think he's had one in a while, but yep. uh, um, I think it was like, those first couple of months where especially our, our nana and our uncles were a bit nervous to talk about having getting the form guide out at nana's house. Yeah. Um, so it was just things like that, just little things that weren't part of um, like second nature to them, but yeah. now we had to adjust. Um, but as I mentioned before, that's probably credit to mum and dad, what they instilled in us early on. Yeah. Uh, and that's why I think we are on the other side of it now, but um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Did it have effects on your footy career, on your performance or on your emotional state? Um, probably my emotional state. I guess what it, what it did, it made me concentrate a lot more on football. So yeah. I guess at training, I'd put a bet on before training. And I'd, first thing I'd do is check what my account was doing after training or a game. So it was that sort of stuff. And I... Uh, I guess the mental sort of side of stuff was really, it changed a lot because I went from worrying about, I wonder if that horse got up to actually concentrating on what I was there to do. So that was, yeah, it's a bit of a relief. I guess what one thing it probably has done is uh, like you carry things and you probably know this, you, you learn to um, do a lot of things. You learn to lie, you learn to, yeah. um, you know, manipulate all that sort of stuff. So that sort of stuff, I continue to keep breaking down. And I guess that's another thing that I keep trying to, when I speak to people about it is that you're going to carry traits and you might go back to drugs or you might go back to that punt one day, 
Um, but it's how you come out of that and you've got to keep learning and get better at it every time. And, um, yeah, these traits that you might carry, like, yeah, they, they might pop up every now and again, but you've got to just keep working your way through it. And, um, one day you'll, you'll shape yourself into the person you want to become and, um, you know, keep leading, leading the way for your family and that. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So, I think that's somewhere where I want to go and just, just to kind of give the listeners an insight into how kind of mad it actually gets. Cause I remember you telling me a story, I think it was on the podcast we did. And I was like, <laughs> I've heard a lot of like crazy stuff before, but I'm like, that is insane. Um, like just talk us through a couple of things that you would do um, in full flight in your gambling addiction. And I guess the place it actually gets to. Yeah. So we just had the TV um, set up in the room and uh, my, my wife now, um, she would be like sleeping. It'd be like two o'clock in the morning um, and I'd be hanging off the side of the bed would um, I mute the sound and yeah, I'd just be watching every time she'd move. I'd just bang, turn the TV off um, and pretend like nothing had ever happened she'd be like oh you're right and i'm like i'd be like oh, what? what what like what like i'm pretending to be asleep yeah um so yeah that was something and i'd stay up till like two or three in the morning knowing i had to be at training at like 7 a.m 8 a.m yeah but if i wasn't like if i was on a roll like i couldn't get enough of that feeling yeah so uh, there was like nothing that could sort of stop me yeah um but yeah and then like the other stuff like Checking like checking scores, um, checking results at halftime of games and yeah, just stuff I look back on now. I'm like, what the fuck were you thinking? Like, there's just yeah. no way that um, that this could like, how can you pro- uh, actually be a top professional athlete and do that at the same time? Yeah, and is there like an actual? F- physical euphoric feeling you, you said that you could when you're on a roll you couldn't get enough of that feeling was it yeah was it some sort of euphoria or yeah probably liken it to probably kicking a goal yeah like that sort of feeling and anyone who's played sport doesn't matter what sort of level it is they know that feeling if they like score a goal or um get a, in basketball you know score a, like hit a three-pointer like yeah. that sort of stuff you walk away and you're like yeah all right but let's do that again. It's that feeling like, all right, yeah. I want more of that. Yeah. So yeah, I, I liken it to that. A hundred percent. Really interesting. So, so that's kind of the peak madness. Can both of you guys talk me through, I guess, I'm not sure if there was many rock bottoms, you know, I, I know for me, my story, I had a few like really bad moments and then I still didn't sort of give it up. Like I just kept going. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that was the same for you, but talk, talk us through, yeah, some of those rock bottom moments, both from your perspective, Alan, and your perspective, Aaron, and then how you guys actually um, helped Alan to, you know, come out of it and um, get help and what did you do for help, all those kinds of things. Yeah, I guess for me, um, the moment, like I went from, all like betting every day to I had the um, football manager of the club knock on the door and hit, like said, like, have you been borrowing money off someone? And that was pretty much my rock bottom moment. Cause up until then I was completely oblivious to what I was actually doing. Yeah. And, um, and I didn't really care to be honest. I, yeah. was, I was very selfish in, in the way that I was with either using my own money or manipulating the, the way that I'd had money in my account. So there was, there was that. And then coming, him coming over and actually being called out on it. Yeah. It was definitely my rock bottom moment because other than that, I was just completely, completely didn't want anything to do with losing. Um, sort of wanted to be like popular in a way by, you know, giving the boys tips and, um, oh, boys, I've heard that. I've heard this. Um, and the thing is, they completely contradict. Like, I'd that many contacts. Like, I'd have four or five jo- like jockeys or trainers, like, for the same race, all telling me they're going to win. And I'd be telling them, <laughs> I'd be like telling different information to different people. Um, 
So yeah, that was probably, that's definitely it. And then from that moment on, it was all about trying to, to work my way back. And uh, I, I think about it now, well, like it's tough at the moment, like being at home. Um, yeah. But I, I guess we can go into that a bit later, but it's pretty fun at the moment, just dealing with what's going on. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So were you involved in that process, Aaron and the rest of the family? Um, were you in contact with the club or, or people around Alan trying to help him? Like, how does that all that kind of work? How do they broach that kind of a situation, I guess? Yeah. Uh, I suppose from our family perspective uh, and my, my perspective, we weren't, or I'm assuming dad might have been, but um, myself, I had nothing really to do with the football side of things. Yep. Um, it wasn't probably until Alan came over to her home in Lara and explained what was going on. And because um, yep. I think our other brother, Luke, had got a few messages and um, on his Facebook. So um, I think Alan just came over and I don't know why, but I remember, I still remember it. I was, I was quite angry at him. I yeah. think he can attest to this. I was pretty angry. I didn't speak to him for a while. Um, and I don't, I don't know why I felt like that, but um, it's probably the last ever real fallout we've, we've had. And it only lasted a couple of days. And, and then, yeah, um, yeah, we just, um, you know, it was important that we did stick together. And obviously, we've had uncles yep. played in the AFL. We've had a dad who's got a fo good footballing um, repertoire. So, mm -hmm. it's. Um, I think for Alan, my perspective is that he, he didn't want to let down our name almost. Yep. Um, he'd won a premiership and everything. Um, so, but yeah, it was just a credit to him to um, how, how open he was with everything in the end. Um, and then, yeah here we are today yeah it really is a credit because that's from um my own experience and all the people that you know we've talked to and tried to help that's like the biggest thing that people struggle with at the start and probably the biggest thing that um makes people slip back into it is just that overwhelming shame for whatever reason the stuff that you've done the people you've let down that kind of perpetuates the guilt and perpetuates you back into those addictive patterns just to kind of escape stuff you know so it, it is a real credit and you know i could never imagine having to um kind of front up to that like it was hard enough for me i had my ass hanging out of my pants and i was like completely fucked no one on the face of the planet knew who i was but you know like i imagine it would be really really hard to do that if you have some sort of a public profile and actually front up to things and change them um you know, did you have, so I, I know that was like the the time that you stopped and gave up and got the help. Did you have moments before that where you'd tried um, to change things up or you were just kind of in denial about the whole thing? Yeah, there was no no way that I ever thought about um, stopping uh, only because like if I went on holiday, I'd be like, oh, if, if I put 200 on a horse here, like yep. I've got 800 extra, but like I might have 800 extra for the holiday and we can go do something nice or yep. something like that. So every moment leading up to that, there was always something to do with betting and um, trying to you know, make, my, make my life a little bit easier. Yeah. Yeah. When in retrospect, it, it wasn't at all. Yeah. It's so interesting. So, um, what did you guys actually like? What did you do to get help? And Aaron, did you guys as the family do anything to get help as well? Like for yourselves or was it more just all sort of like focused on Alan? I think we just sheltered around Alan, to be yeah. honest. We, um, um, similar to him, I think we, especially in that um, certain time, we just went cold turkey. Um, dad, dad and mum might ban the, um, the whatever, Sky Racing channels on Foxtel. Like yeah. Just little things like that. Uh, yeah. um, but no, it was just more about supporting him, just asking him how he was. Yeah. Um, I think that was a big one. Like, obviously, he had to admit something pretty big. Um, and so just being there to support him. But it's as simple as asking him how he was because, yeah. you know, you could, even though he didn't live together, you could still sense that he was in a pretty dark spot. Yeah. So it was just about supporting. It's so interesting. And Aaron, I'm, 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 um, yeah, I'm curious to know in sort of, like I know you sort of said that you found out late um, or it wasn't, you know, you found out and then it wasn't long until you guys actually managed to rally around Alan and do something to help him stop. Was it 
kind of that approach. There's this big thing in the drug and alcohol world of tough love and um, kind of, I guess, um, helping someone to their rock bottom. It sounds like you guys actually did the opposite um, and, you know, really got around him and tried to support him as much as you can. Um, was that kind of the tactic, the advice that you got, or was that just something that came naturally to the, to the family? I think it was just, um, especially my brother, Luke and I, um, just because how close us three are. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure dad would have sent a few rockets up Alan. Like that, there's, <laughs> there's, there's no denying that. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, just the way, just the way we are like with each other. Um, yep. I can't remember like key conversations, but I think it was just more about that nurturing and caring, but make sure you're there for him. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because it's something that I actually fight against really, um, you know, um, really badly is that tough love. I hate it. Um, and it actually doesn't work. And it's, it's good to hear you say that because there's a lot of families that listen to this stuff. Um, and although it can be hard dealing with someone that's like kind of going through addiction, whatever it is, it's important. Yeah. To be firm. And as you said, your, your dad probably sent a few rockets up you, but the, people just need to know that the people that are around them are there to support them as much as possible when they do ask for help. Um, Cause if you cut that off and they don't feel like there's going to be support, they're never going to reach out and feel comfortable to admit it and make a change. So oh, that's, it's interesting. Well, that was the thing as well. We, we were honest as well. Like yep. we didn't sugarcoat anything. And I think Alan can say that no, no one sugarcoated anything. Um, yep. We had to be honest with him, but at the same time, we didn't want to go too far. And then ruin a, like a relationship. Yeah. Um, so that was that was pretty that was very important. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you actually do, Alan? Like, what was the process of getting um, recovery and stopping punting and changing things up? Uh, so, firstly, uh, manager, uh, football manager. So the club um, made sure they like seen everything. So um, saw my bank accounts, all that sort of worked out roughly where I was at um, financially. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you sort of had to ex like flesh all that out and show everyone and expose it all. And yeah, right. Yeah, just, just to work out because there was like I hadn't paid um, like my mortgage payment for a couple of months and stuff like that. So yeah. I was starting to really like I was probably, what year was that? Term 14. So I was um, sort of peak like, I'm just coming into my fourth year of footy. So I was starting to earn some good cash yeah. and I, I wasn't at all saving any money. And I was really battling to um, pay my mortgage payments. So they sort of had to work out what was going on um, there. It was pretty obvious when they had a look, but uh, then I uh, met with a, a couple of people, um, some high profile um, AFL footballers who are, um, you know, who have dealt with it. Uh, and then it was just like, all right, do I work out? Do I want to um, get back in control and still be able to have a bet with my mates? Or do I just stop altogether? And um, I made the decision to just stop altogether, which is completely yeah. my decision. Um, the people who are around, um, they, they, you pretty much got to accept what the person wants to do or it's not going to work. So yeah. uh, then we... I don't know, what, long time ago now, it's about six years. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, it's pretty much just my, the family. Um, you, I just started telling, telling people what was going on because yep. um, that's the, the way I kept myself accountable because um, I was sick of letting people down and um, especially when it came to that. So the more people you tell, the, uh, you know, the more accountable you are to um, staying true to your words. So, yeah, it was pretty much from that point on. I just uh, all my bank accounts like were all open, so people could see them. Uh, like took all like the racing channels off. Um, yeah, off the Foxtel, um, took all the apps off my phone. Emailed the betting companies saying I'm not allowed to um, be a part of this anymore. Yep. So and then pretty much from there on it's just about having a bit of having a bit of you know strength and not not knowing that you know if you go back to that you're going to be letting a lot of people down so yeah i'm not saying that everyone can 
do it like like I did because there's probably a, I probably ride the emotions pretty high now and I, I get pretty low. Yeah. Um, when like as we said, like we might touch on it later, but at the, like at the moment, like it is, it's getting pretty hard to uh, you know, to resist because there's one, you're not doing anything, and two, it's the only live sport on at the moment. So yeah, yeah, it's pretty pretty nuts. But um, it just goes back to you know what's at stake. Like, is it worth it? And um, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um... I do really want to touch on that because um, it's exactly what people have kind of been saying um, to me and the reason why we're talking to you guys. Um, Cause there's, yeah, so many people going through exactly the same thing with this gambling stuff. There's just not much to do and only yeah. the horse racing on. Um, so when you gave up and you mentioned that kind of part of the process was you spoke to some other um high profile players that had kind of given up gambling. Was that something that was massive for you? Like a, a big help, just having someone that you can kind of relate to? Yeah. And like, it sort of made, it normalized it yeah. um, a bit for me. And then I met like just everyday people who had been through the same thing. And then that made me feel like, all right, this can happen to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and then you know, you sort of just get on with your life, um, not worrying about looking over your back going, oh, you know, this bloke loves a punt. Like, and I've had it on the ground, like people saying that to me and all, all that sort of stuff. And mm. you just, you just de- I, like, you just deal with it. Like, if people want to get it in your head and that's the sort of route they want to take, then, um, you know, it is what it is. Like, yeah, like cool. Uh, but, yeah, it's just being able to sort of recognize, yeah, how far you've come is, is huge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I guess, did you turn over? Cause something that a lot of people have told me when they give up the punt, um, yeah, they give over a lot of their control for a little while, like financially to family and stuff like that. Did you give, did you sort of turn over control to Aaron and, um, or have you helped with that? kind of struck new structure Aaron in that process um no it was mainly um partner mum and dad and uh and my manager so they they sort of saw it all and sort yeah. of they were my main points of um call if I needed anything yeah all right so I want to ask just before we go into like kind of what's going on now I want to ask both of you guys a question just to um give people like a real practical application that they can do from both someone wanting to come out of addiction um and i guess family trying to help someone come out of it as well so from the family's perspective they're right in the thick of it loved ones right in the middle of addiction like what's kind of three to five really practical things that they can focus on aaron and implement do say that's going to help um, so I think the first thing is just acknowledging that yeah. there's something there um, and then being able to process what it is. And then just um, like in our situation, Alan was able to be honest and then he was able to act upon it. But then it's, it's who you surround yourself with and being honest with them as well. Yeah. Um, so obviously you have your core group and then your external group. So obviously your friends. Yeah. Um, so I know for a fact, like Alan's mates still love the punt, um, but they yeah. know for a fact that Alan can't do that anymore, but purely because of what's going on in the past. Yeah. Um, and then I think the other thing is just to remember that he's like, you're never f- fully cured from the addiction. Yeah. Um, so like, I know like spring carnival, I know Alan hasn't touched on it, but like spring carnival, I know that's like a massive week for Alan and, um, so we always try and do something, especially on Melbourne Cup Day, when everyone, it's all over the social media. Yep. Um, every ad you see on TV is some form of sp- sports betting company. Yep. Um, so just being able to find something to almost take your mind off it. And then, um, but yeah, just acknowledging. Yep. Just reiterate that. And then you, need, you just need to seek the um, suitable support networks. 
Yeah. No, it's, um, it's, it's really interesting you say that because I have the same conversation with families every day. They sort of say to me, oh, what do we do? We, we don't want to say the wrong thing and set Billy or Bob off on, you know, kind of a binge or, you know, a massive weekend of the punting or whatever it is. And I, and I always say that to them. I'm like, what? So you're just going to pretend like it's not happening, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, you gotta, you gotta actually say honestly what's going on and um, acknowledge it within the family as well, because what I've found, and I don't know, I think you kind of mentioned it before, but, and I don't know if it was happening, like, I'm sure there was kind of, you, you sort of said it got normal. And I find that families kind of almost go into more denial around what's happening when it's happening than the person themselves. Like, you know, would you kind of say that as well? That's what happened with you guys for a period. Yeah, absolutely. I think especially like you're in a, you're like, in Geelong's like a fishbowl. So everyone, yeah. knows, <laughs> everyone knows who Alan is. So I'm the, I'm the youngest brother. So um, every little rumor that comes up on the first one to get on the front foot and say, nah, that's not happening. Yep. Um, yep. But I think as time has gone on, we all, we've all just adjusted and we've, we're all open and honest about everything that's happened now. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's good advice. And what about from someone that's kind of in the thick of it, Alan, and they're kind of going, yeah, I, I don't want to be doing this anymore. Or I think this is kind of a bit crazy, um, but I'm struggling to stop. Like what's kind of three or f- three to five things that they can just do straight away to help. Yeah. I've been um, trying to think of uh that over the last month or so, just because one, when we um, relaunch our, our stuff, um, we want to be able to uh, help people. I think the big one is uh, being able to just do some exercise. Yep. Um, and just even going for a walk every time you're, or just getting up out of your seat, yep. leaving your phone. Um, Cause people might be doing it at work, which is like, that's the thing with apps and stuff now is that you can it's just so easy it's like playing on a calculator yeah so every time like you get the urge put your phone down and just walk around if you're in an office or whatever just go for a walk and um i feel like if you can come up with a saying or work out like a sort of a mantra every time yeah. you're you you've got this urge if it's um don't don't let people down or don't do it again yeah. or just put something into your head or that was the old you, this is the new me or something like that. Yeah. Um, that can really um, trigger your mind. So triggers um, instead of, yeah, the triggers that um, we all have as addicts um, or people who have dealt with um, addictions is like triggers are massive. So if you can tr- create a trigger for yourself to not, um, want to bet or, you know, give yourself an hour or two without that urge. I, I think it's massive. Um, I think cooking, cleaning, writing. Yep. Um, listen to, yeah. <laughs> music. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, all these things, ringing your mate, just saying, finding that person that you can ring your yeah. mate. And hey, like I'm struggling. Can you talk for an hour? Yeah. Um, and I've had those conversations, and I have a guy that I've met twice in my life. But anytime I know, I can ring him, and he'll sit on the, the phone for five hours with me if he needs to. Wow. So, yeah. yeah, it's just those sort of things, and that's what we're going to try and do is be able to give people, especially like because we are based in Brisbane. Yep. Um, if there's people in Brisbane who are struggling and cause you are still allowed to go out and exercise, um, during these times, we're going to start giving some places where you can go and walk, you can go bushwalk. Awesome. Um, do, yeah. So, um, we're yeah, coming up with that, some activities and yeah, I, it's pretty, pretty exciting. Yeah. So, so it sounds like having a circuit breaker is like a massive thing when it comes to this stuff. Um, ha- ha- roughly like, because it's a question I always get when you have that urge or the craving, like how long do you find it kind of lasts for? And every time you break the circuit, do you find it kind of makes you that 
much more stronger for the next time or is it something that just comes in waves different levels yeah yeah i, I feel like and i don't know what it's like with you but every time i sort of get that feeling i actually get really nervous yeah. um like um it's like this sick feeling and i might not even be thinking directly about um punt or horses or whatever but I just get this really sick feeling in my stomach. And I don't know if that's something that I've been, it's like a defense mechanism for me now yeah. um, that I've had to sort of teach myself. But yeah, I, so when I come out of that, the, the feeling I get now is like, all right, you can like keep moving forward now. Like you're past that. Yeah. And just having, yeah, being able to identify it. And because I've dealt with it for a long time now, I know, I get that feeling. I know what I have to do. Yeah. So I'll get, I'll put my phone down and I'll go for a walk. Um, I'll grab the dog and we'll go somewhere. Um, and then I'll like either write um, some stuff in a, in a journal um, or, you know, it's, it's easy. It's just like watching something funny on Netflix or yeah. something. Yeah. Just something that completely changes your mind. Uh, your mindset is yeah. uh, pretty, pretty important. So, yeah, uh, I love it. It's, it's a really good tip. It's one of the big things that we recommend to people as well because um, you just need something to, I don't know, interfere, put in between you and the next, the next yeah. urge, the next punt, whatever it is. So, um, and I love that you guys are going to put together some resources and have some really practical stuff for people to do. I think it's awesome, particularly with like gambling as well because, look, there's not heaps out there about alcohol and drugs, but there's definitely not much about gambling yeah. help, I find anyway. So I think that's awesome. So tell us, because it's the whole reason why we're kind of talking today is because people, are, um, you know, it's hard enough as it is if you've got an addiction. Um, um, I always think that gambling and probably alcohol are the hardest too, because like you said, it's fucking everywhere. Like, it's just, it's not like... <laughs> Yeah, you just like turn on the TV and boom, like there's gambling advertising and particularly now there's only horse racing on. I've had sports bet text me like six times since this whole thing's happened. You know, like there's there's lots of stuff going on. So yeah, like talk to us a bit about what's going on for you guys and how you're dealing with all of it at the moment. You mentioned that it's kind of been a bit tough um, being isolated. Yeah, it... it... I think it's tough for anyone who's sort of going, who's been through something like this and then going through what we're going through as a society at the moment. Hmm. The ads, have, I feel like, have really ramped up, um, which is, uh, I understand, like, they've got to make a living. Um, yeah. I understand, like, it's a job for a lot of people. And I understand that people can have a bet and be okay. Mm. So, and if they can do that, then I, I think it's okay. It's for people like me, you've got to be able to go, all right, I can't put myself in a vulnerable position. Mm. And that's, that's where, where you'll find that people will go, all right, do I really want to um, stay clean? Do I really want to like do this? Yep. Or do I go, oh, it's easy. Like I'm sitting at home. Yep. Oh, you know, I'm saving a bit of money because I'm not going out on the weekend. Oh, like, fuck it. I'm going for it. Yeah. And that's the mindset that's really dangerous at the moment. So being able to find, as you said, that circuit breaker is crucial at the moment. And if you're working from home um, or you're someone like me who has to do exercise um, every day, but then I literally have nothing else to do. Like a, my job, like I don't have a job really. I just got to keep fit. Um, and there's plenty of people out there who've lost their jobs and sort of just relying on government help. Mm. It's like being able to find what makes you tick every day is so crucial at the moment. So okay. yeah, as I said, we're, we're trying to put things together now that, you know, and might not work for some people, but if it can help one or two people, I think that's the most, um, important thing. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, I, I always say that um, all of this stuff. There's no one kind of silver bullet. Um, it's 
it's no. kind of like lots of little things put together that helps and you just it's sometimes it's not even about the activity it's about like the intention and and trying to do do something different that's actually helpful like aaron from your perspective you know and, and i know that um alan's kind of six years down the track now and doing well and all that kind of stuff but have you as a family member been more aware of um kind of him and his state and what's going on and all that type of stuff yeah like like i mentioned before especially like around certain times like the spring carnival um, yeah um but like even when as as you boys just mentioned like ads on tv like yeah. i could be sitting on my phone clicking through social media and then i'll hear like a sports bet ad but my mind automatically clicks to turn the station over yeah um so just little 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 triggers like that nowadays yeah um but alan, um but i feel like alan's um found like a good little outlet with his golf and his and his cooking so yeah but especially especially now um it's hard for me because i'm 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 fortunate like i'm still able to work quite a yep. bit um yep. i'm still working full time but um, so I don't know what's going on during the day, but we, we have a pretty pretty open relationship. So I'm pretty sure that he would um, say to me if he was feeling a bit flat. I know he's I'm, I know he's <laughs> making me feel he's never worked out in my life. So um, put on a few kgs, which is all right, but um, just little things like that. Um, but yeah, that's about it. So yeah, yeah. Um, uh no, it's, it's really good. And I think um, just for all the families listening to this is that uh, the thing that I've recognized, because I know from my mum as well, um, when I was in the heart of things, she, and it wasn't only until I talked to her afterwards, but she didn't realize how much of an impact she was having on me just by kind of talking to me and supporting me and um, the different things that she said and all that kind of stuff. And that's what I'd say to families is that, yeah, you'd never, you never know the impact that you're actually having and the difference that you're making for someone, even if it doesn't feel like it, even if they're getting annoyed at you and angry and whatever, like keep going, keep supporting, keep helping because, yeah, it, it, it makes a difference. So, like, just to, just to kind of finish up, um, people are in isolation. They're going nuts. It's awesome. You're kind of talking about um, different stuff that they can do. Um, you're going to put some resources together. Like, what would you kind of say to people at this time? Like, how do they, how do they get through? Like, is is it important to kind of talk to people? Um, yeah, like they need to go out, break circuits. Like, yeah, there's. I know I'm going a bit crazy. There's nothing on the TV. Like, there's no footy on. I can't can't watch anything. Like, yeah. what's the what's what's the main thing that you're doing um to kind of keep saying you mentioned exercise but is there any other like little practical tips that you're doing that's helping yeah um well we've done even little things like we mowed a golf course into our backyard <laughs> like and playing with ping pong <laughs> yeah um playing ping with ping pong balls and and a wedge yeah. so even little things like that one, it took me an hour and a half to actually mow. So there's bang, an hour and a half. And then we played for three hours um, just yeah. mucking around in the backyard. Uh, I think of what I've seen from a lot of people, a lot of people have just been able to do like some home maintenance, um, yeah. stuff like that. But my message to now people, if you're feeling like the way I'm, I'm feeling at the moment um, or, or like you feel like you, you've got that craving, that urge again, this is a strange time and it throws you off kilter pretty quickly. If you can get through the next, we don't know how long, if you can get through the next four to six weeks, like this is probably one of the hardest times you'll ever, you'll have, ever have yeah. as an addict being at home, um, you know, probably saving more money than you ever have because <laughs> you can't do all these things. I think if you can get through these next um, few weeks or months or whatever it is, like, you'll go, wow, like I'm stronger than I, than I thought I was. My fa your family will go, like, we're so proud of you for being able to do that. And then third, I feel like you can attack the rest of your life with so much more gusto and um, freedom. Yeah. 
Love it, man. Love it. It's, um, it's, it's actually a really good advice as well. Just trying to put things into perspective and thinking about how kind of strong you'll be out the other side. I love it. So yeah. Look, guys, I appreciate you guys coming on. Just again, we, we mentioned it in the uh, pre-recorded introduction as well, but where can everybody find you? And um, you're mentioning that you have a show, Addicted to the, Addicted to the Game podcast. Yep. Um, so we, are, we intend to be relaunching in the next four to six weeks. So we're just making a, um, a bit of a shuffle on um, how the show looks, but um, you can always hit us up on... ATTG podcast on Instagram or in capitals on Twitter, it's ATTG underscore podcast. So um, yeah, you can always hit us up on there. Um, and if there's anyone out there who might be struggling, uh, you can always, especially with the punt, um, you can always just yeah, hit us up in our DMs and one of the boys will um, be able to, to help out for sure. Awesome. Love it, man. And I just want to say like to both of you guys as well. Um, so first of all, the biggest, resp like I love that we had Aaron on today kind of talking it through live as, as Alan was, geez, Alan and Aaron, and they both look like dead ringers <laughs> like each other. It's talk about tough, but yeah, it's awesome. It's been awesome having Aaron on um, talking oh, us through live. Dirty slug. <laughs> <laughs> um, talking us through live because... <laughs> The, the most engagement that we ever get is that when we talk about family issues. So we really appreciate that. And yeah, just appreciate that you're kind of putting it out there, Alan, um, with the position that you had. Cause I know for me, there's a guy that used drugs and alcohol that played footy. You know, I love sport, Gavin Krasiska. Um, and he does a lot of stuff yep. in the drug and alcohol space now. And he had like one of the biggest impacts on me staying, staying on the, you know straight and narrow so um yeah i just i hope you realize how powerful your message is with the kind of standing that you have in the community and stuff so yeah, yeah. we really appreciate it both you guys thanks for coming on thanks, thanks mate. appreciate it awesome cheers guys Hey YouTube watcher, thanks for watching this video and I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you and your family are doing well in these extraordinary times. I also wanna ask you, can you please subscribe and hit the bell notification? We're really launching into our YouTube channel this year and wanna build our audience so that we can progress through the ranks and basically get the message of recovery and hope and change and all that good stuff out there to as many people as we can. So we would love it if you would consider it and subscribe and help us out. Also for anyone seeking help um, and information and resources, we've put together a 100% free online course that you can access, link in the description. Um, so if you are looking for help, hope that you know is something that can help you out as well. Um, until next time, see you in the next video. Peace.